to understand God's original purpose for man. <clears throat> we need to go back to Genesis in chapter 1 and 2. <clears throat> and ever since man slipped away from that purpose, God's desire has been to bring man back to the place where he was meant to be. And that's not just overcoming sin. Because when Adam and Eve was crea were created, there was no question of sin. Sin wasn't even there in Genesis 1 and 2. We have spoken a lot about overcoming sin because that's such a problem for all of us. But we need to look higher than there if you want to understand God's purpose for us. So what we see here was that on the sixth day, God made man in his image, as we read in Genesis 1.26. And then he saw everything that he had made, and it was very good. And that was the sixth day. And Genesis 2, verse 2, God completed his work and he rested on the seventh day. And he blessed and sanctified it. And he did not allow man to go into the garden that day. He had to go the next day. So we see there, as soon as God created man, the first thing that God wanted him to learn and to do was to spend a whole day in fellowship with him. That, is, that was the first Sabbath. So, you know, in the, under the law, people thought it was just a question of not doing any work. But the, on the first day, it was not just a question of no work. The first day that Adam was, his existence was a day of fellowship in the presence of God the whole day. And it's as it were, God said to Adam, the work in the garden can wait. You don't have to worry about that. That can wait. We can be so taken up with trying to do something for the Lord when God wants us to be with him more than doing something for him. And if you really want to do something that's going to last for eternity, it must begin with your fellowship with God in his presence. And everything that you do must be in his presence. Now, this is not possible in the Old Testament. As soon as man sinned, he was cast out from the presence of God. It was not just that he became a sinner. He lost the presence of God. And Jesus came not just to forgive our sins and not just to give us power to overcome sin, not just to baptize us in the Holy Spirit, etc. It was to bring us back into the presence of God, just like on the first day man was created, that first Sabbath, and to enable us to live there every single day of our earthly life before we go to heaven and we enjoy his presence in fullness. Now if we don't make that our goal and you make something less than that your goal like getting victory over sin or doing something for him, you'll always find frustration. And that's the reason why a lot of people who seek victory over sin never get there. Because that's not God's final goal for you. His goal is that you might live in his presence. I want to show you a verse in Acts of the Apostles chapter 2 when Peter was describing the earthly life of Jesus Christ. In his first sermon, what he said was, concerning Jesus. He was preaching to this crowd of people on the day of Pentecost. 
And he says in Acts 2.22, Men of Israel, Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders. And he says something about the life of Jesus here. In verse 25, I want you to listen to this. David says about Jesus, I was always beholding the Lord in my presence. And the last part of verse 28, Thou wilt make me full of gladness with thy presence. Jesus' life was one where he constantly lived in the presence of his Father. And the result was, he was never disturbed by whatever happened around him. And so this passage in Acts 2, 25 to 28 shows us how Jesus lived his earthly life. It wasn't just the miracles. He lived in the Father's presence. So he knew what to do at each particular time. He wasn't just going around doing miracles all the time. You know, once he went to the pool of Bethesda, and we read there in John 5, there was a great multitude of people there who were sick, blind, lame, deaf, all types of things. And he went there and he healed one person, one lame man, told him to take his bed and walk, and he came away. And there were hundreds of others just lying there and never healed any of them. How's that? Because Jesus didn't come here to heal the sick. He lived in the Father's presence and he did what the Father told him to do. And if the Father didn't tell him to do something, he just didn't do it. He wasn't in unrest that he couldn't heal somebody. He was never in unrest. And I want to say, dear brothers and sisters, that God's will is that we might come to this life of rest in God. I think of another instance where, you know the story of Peter and John at the beautiful gate of the temple. There was a man sitting there asking for alms. Uh, for 40 years he'd been sitting there. And I've often thought how Jesus must have passed by that gate so many times in his three and a half years with the greatest power of healing that any man ever had. He walked by that man, and when the man asked for money, Jesus did not heal him. He gave him money. He told Judas, give him some money. He'd see him the next day. He'd ask for money. Jesus said, give him money. And he was sitting there lame. Because Jesus didn't come here to heal. He lived in the Father's presence, so he never made a mistake. If he had healed that person that day when he walked by, okay, it had been, it had been one of the 1,000 miracles that he did. But because he did not heal him, three years later, when Peter saw him, and Peter said, silver and gold I have none in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. We read in Acts chapter 4, 5,000 people believed. That's why Jesus didn't heal him. If Jesus had healed him, there wouldn't have been those 5,000 people who believed when they saw him healed on that day. Do you see something there of, you know, of knowing when to do what God wants us to do? Very few believers understand this. They know what, what to do, but they don't know when God wants them to do it. They, th they think they've just got to go around and do some good on this earth. No. Jesus said, I have come from heaven, not to do my own will, not even to do good to humanity, but to do the will of my Father. The greatest thing that you can do for God on this earth is to do the will of your heavenly Father. If you don't do that and you just go around doing a lot of good, you may discover when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ that you have wasted your life. Now many people don't understand that. And that's why it's very, very important to learn how to live in the presence of God all the time. I've set the Lord always before me. 
That's what we read in Acts chapter 2. And because he was in the Father's presence every single day, he knew exactly what to do. And that's what was God's original purpose for Adam. I want you to be in my presence. But the thing is, when he went into the garden, he should have still lived in God's presence there, even when he went to the garden on the next day. But he didn't. And that's how sin came. So as I said, Jesus has come not just to forgive our sin, not just to help us overcome sin, but to teach us to live in his presence every single day. And that is why we read about certain people who stand before him in the final day. It's an amazing statement. It's almost unbelievable that very few people believe this, but it is true. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 22, many will say to me in that final day, many means, what, what shall I say, a few million people, a few million believers will stand before Jesus and say, you know, people who lived during these 2,000 years, Lord, we prophesied in your name. He's talking, they're talking about ministry, what we did for the Lord. We prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We performed not one or two miracles, but many miracles in your name. And when you read that, think of the great, or not great, but well-known evangelists that we read of who claim today on television and elsewhere to be doing miracles and, and uh, casting out demons and prophesying and astound many believers. I can imagine some of them standing there that day. And he said, the Lord says, I will declare to them, I never knew you. I'm not questioning that you did all this, but I, I never had this personal relationship with you. You didn't live with me. You didn't live in my presence. You just went around doing a whole lot of things for me. And that's a question that we can ask ourselves, whether the Lord will have to say that to us. Lord, I did this, I did this, and I went and did all the other things. And will he ever say, I never knew you. You never lived with me. The word know is an Old Testament word which is used in husband-wife relationships. Adam knew his wife. It's, it's speaking of the most intimate relationship between a man and a woman. And here Jesus uses that word spiritually. I never knew you. You did a lot of things for me. But you didn't have that intimate relationship of living in my presence every day. Do you know that that's the thing that's going to matter in the final day? Not what you did for him, not the miracles you did, not the demons you cast out. Even that's not going to count. It's like having a maid in your house. A maid may do a lot of work in the house, or a servant can do a lot of work for you in the house, but she doesn't have that intimate relationship that the wife has with the husband, with the master of the house. It's something like that. There are a lot of people who are like, who are served the Lord like maids in a house. They're not like the wife. They don't have that intimate relationship with Jesus. And it makes a lot of difference when we seek for this living in this intimate presence of, uh, in, intimately in the presence of God. I want to show you a verse in Hebrews in chapter 4 about something that God wants his people to have. Hebrews 4, it says in verse 9, there remains therefore a Sabbath rest. Now go back to Genesis 2 verse 1, and Adam living in God's presence. And it says here, there remains a Sabbath rest for God's people today. God wants his people to live in his presence exactly like Adam way back in the first day after he was created. And then, with that presence to go out and serve him. That is how Jesus served him. Always dwelling in the Father's presence. That's why he knew whom to heal and whom not to heal and when to do something and when not to do something. I've often thought about Jesus, you know, making chairs and benches and tables up to the age of 30. 
in the carpenter shop when there around him was a world dying in sin. Right there in Nazareth and all over were sinners and everywhere and he knew the scriptures at the age of 12. But he never went out to preach. Why was that? I mean, would you sit making stools and benches if you knew the scriptures at the age of 12 for the next 18 years? We need to understand God's ways. He says, God says, my ways are not your ways. And the more we come to know God, the more we realize that a lot of things we think are very important are not so important to God. What he wants is for us to dwell in his presence and to recognize his presence all the time. And if you make that your goal, it'll make a tremendous difference in your life. For example, why do husbands and wives, despite all that they hear in the church services and in our meetings, still raise their voice at each other or get angry? I'll tell you. It's only one reason. The Lord, they don't recognize the Lord's presence there between them. Think if when you're talking to your wife or husband, you recognize Jesus is right there between you. You think you'll raise your voice at your partner? Never. You think you'd glare at him or her? <laughs> or what, what, what are the things that you would never do in your home if Jesus was physically present there? It's the presence of God that brings deliverance from anger. You can study all the theory of victory over sin, about being crucified and everything else, and still, I've seen this. I've seen for years people who heard all these things and tried to reckon themselves dead and tried to put their flesh to death, but they're still sinning. We need to recognize the presence of God. How can we, there's a Sabbath rest for God's people. And we need to enter into that Sabbath rest. That is what is written in Hebrews chapter 4. It says in chapter 4 verse 1, Let us fear, lest a promise of entering his rest, go back to Genesis 2, 1, Adam's first day. That promise is given to us to dwell in God's presence and you come short of it. You come short of it because you're taken up with something else. You may be a little better than those other believers who say, well, I just want to go to heaven when I die. And you probably pat yourself on the back that I'm not like those Christians who just want to go to heaven when I die. I want to do something for the Lord before I go. Well, I'll tell you what the Lord wants you to do for him. To live in his presence every single moment of your life, every single day. And you say, is that possible? Of course, the devil is there to say no. This is the main purpose of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And that's why people in the Old Testament could not have it. They couldn't have it because until the heart was cleansed through the blood of Jesus, the Holy Spirit could not come and dwell in fullness in a person's heart. But yet there was a longing there. Let me show you an Old Testament passage in Exodus and chapter 33. This is immediately after you read the last verse of Exodus 32. The Lord smote the people because of what they did with the calf which Aaron had made. They had come out of Egypt and they were worshipping this golden calf. And Moses had come down and smashed it. And the Lord said to Moses, he was so angry with the people that he said, Go, I will take you into that land. Verse 2, I will send an angel before you. And I will drive out, Genesis, uh, sorry, Exodus 33, 2. I will drive out the Canaanite, Amorite, Hittite, Parasite, Hivite, and Jebusite. This is a picture of the Lord saying, I will drive out these sinful habits that you have. Those giants in Canaan are a picture of the sins that have ruled your life. Okay, picture them as, think of the sins that have ruled your life, the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Parasite. The Lord says, I will drive them out. What more do you want? You got victory over sin. 
And not only that, I will send an angel. You know, today is a day when lots of people talk about angels. That there, there, somebody says in the meeting, I saw an angel when I was praying. And somebody says, I saw two angels. And then somebody else competes with them and says, I, I saw three angels. It, it's all over. I saw angels. I'll send an angel before you. And you'll go into this land flowing with milk and honey. But I, verse 3, I will not come with you. You see the difference? My presence won't be with you, the Lord says. I'll send an angel. You'll get victory. You'll have visions of angels. You'll have all this, but my presence won't be with you. And you know what Moses said? In verse 15, Lord, if your presence don't, doesn't go with us, I don't want to leave this place. I'd rather be in this wilderness all my life with all the inconvenience of this wilderness, if you don't go with us. I'm not interested in angels. I'm not interested in victory over the Canaanites and the Hittites and all my sinful habits. I want you. I want to ask you, my brothers and sisters, what are you looking for in your life? Is it the longing for the presence of the Lord? Lord, if you're not going to go with me, I'm not interested. I'm not interested in visions of angels. I'm not interested in experiences and thrills and supernatural experiences. I'm not interested in casting out demons and healing the sick and ministry and powerful preaching. No, I want you. If your presence does not go with me, I don't want to move one inch from this place. Where are the people like that today? Moses had that desire. And that's why God honored him. And I believe God's looking for people like that in our midst will say, Lord, I'm not interested in these sins being driven out of my life. That's not the main thing in my life. Not even visions of angels, but your presence. I want to sense your presence with me all the time, every single moment. That will solve every problem of mine. You know how comforted and satisfied the disciples were when Jesus was with them. There was never a problem that they couldn't solve if Jesus was there. It didn't matter if it was a storm in the lake or any problem they faced. If Jesus was there, it was okay. It's the presence of the Lord that we must long for. That's the meaning of the Sabbath rest that God gave Adam on the very first day. Then why is it that so many don't have it? Even some who have managed to come to a certain amount of victory over sin and to come to a knowledge of the scriptures and we can explain the new covenant and we, some of us have got now knowledge of the scripture to be able to explain the new covenant to others but the sense of God's presence there with me is not all the time. For example, you know if Jesus were with you all the time you'd never be in a bad mood. Are you ever in a bad mood? I don't believe that's God's will. I used to have a lot of bad moods. But it's gone from my life. I, I'm just giving you my testimony. Because I say, Lord, I'm not interested in preaching. I'm not interested in healing the sick or casting out demons. I'm not even interested in just plain victory over sin. I want to be in your presence all the time. And in your presence, that nobody can have a bad mood. Let me show you that in scripture. Turn with me to Psalm 16. That's the verse that Peter quoted on the day of Pentecost about Jesus. Psalm 16. And it says in verse 11, Psalm 16, verse 11, Thou wilt make known to me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. Just think of that little phrase that gripped my heart once. Because I was seeking for a life where I could obey the command of God in Philippians 4 which says rejoice in the Lord always. For many years I sought to find the secret of obeying that command. Rejoice in the Lord always 24-7. It's impossible to be in a bad mood if you're rejoicing the Lord 24-7. The two don't go together. And I discovered when I read this verse 
that can be true only if you dwell in God's presence because it says in your presence is fullness of joy it's not found anywhere else it's not by technique it's not by remembering some doctrine or it's not by quoting a scripture it's in God's presence and so I made it a rule for myself and it's a good thing if you make that rule for yourself also any time I do not have fullness of joy I am not in the Lord's presence I said that to myself I never said that for many years after I was born again I thought oh, it was normal I mean who in the world can be uh, rejoicing all the time that's ridiculous it's impossible that's exactly what the devil says it's impossible and the devil says never mind what the Bible says about rejoicing the Lord always it's impossible and forget it God's commands are impossible according to your faith be it unto you if you believe it's impossible it'll be impossible but the reason is not because it's impossible the reason is we are not dwelling in God's presence in thy presence is fullness of joy so doesn't that mean that if I'm not having fullness of joy I'm not in God's presence I'm somewhere else maybe I'm doing many things for the Lord but I'm not in God's presence this is the most important thing what did the power of the Holy Spirit mean for Jesus Christ let me show you in Acts chapter 10 because that's what it's going to do for us as well in Acts chapter 10 it says in verse 38 you know Jesus of Nazareth this is Peter preaching to the house of Cornelius uh, sorry yeah Peter preaching in the house of Cornelius and telling the people there God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with power and he went about doing good and when I read that I said Lord that's what I want I want all my life to go about doing good to people spiritual good physical good material good whatever it is some type of good God's kept me on earth to good do good to others and I can't do the good I should be doing unless I'm filled with the Holy Spirit and he says Jesus went about doing good I've often thought what a wonderful thing if that could be written on our tombstone he lived from so-and-so date to so-and-so date and he went about doing good because he was filled with the Holy Spirit that's what they said about Jesus and the reason was you read the rest of that verse God was with him that's the reason that's what the fullness of the Holy Spirit brought to Jesus the presence of the Father with him all the time and when the presence of the Father was with him he was full of joy that's one thing and the other thing is he went about doing good so I see this is the life I want Lord I want a life where I'm never in a bad mood and never discouraged and never upset with anybody where I'm ready to forgive everyone and overlook the evil other people do to me and rejoice in spite of a lot of things that may go wrong on earth but that's possible only in God's presence in his presence there's fullness of joy and when God is with me like Jesus I can go about doing good the words I speak will do good to people not just from the pulpit even in ordinary conversation think of this my dear brothers and sisters what a wonderful life you can live you an ordinary believer with no gift of preaching no supernatural gift that you can live a life where wherever you go you're going to do good just like it says in Psalm 23 goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life what that means is wherever I go goodness mercy means a merciful attitude a forgiving merciful attitude to other people just follow me that means if I go to a home when I leave that home I've left goodness and mercy behind I meet a brother for a few minutes I'm not talking about preaching just meet a brother somewhere on the street or when I leave him I've left some goodness and mercy behind with him 
Imagine if all of us lived like that, not being great preachers or doing miracles, just God being with us and we go about doing good. That's what Jesus did. And you'll accomplish a lot more in your life and you'll be able to stand one day before the Lord with great satisfaction that you accomplished what God wanted you to do on this earth. But you must long for it. Turn now with me to Jeremiah in chapter 29. Jeremiah chapter 29. Verse 11. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. These, these verses, 11 to 14 are a, a, beautiful, a beautiful promise that you can seek to apply to yourself. Jeremiah 29 plans to give you a welfare, not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. And you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me. Now we're thinking of seeking God's presence. Lord, I want to dwell in your presence. Every day, all the time. I want to be so filled with the Holy Spirit every day that I'm dwelling in your presence. How can I have this life? And the Lord says, you seek me. And you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. When you're longing for this more than anything else. When you're longing not for the approval of men, not to make more money, not that your business might, might prosper, all that will, God will take care of, but that you might dwell in God's presence all the time. When you seek me with all your heart, when you're more interested in living in my presence, more than even victory over sin, that'll come if you dwell in my presence. Don't put the cart before the horse. I feel a lot of people do that. They're looking for a victory without the presence of the Lord. And they seem to grasp it and then in a day or two it slips away. Why is that? You shall seek me and you will find me when you seek for me with all your heart. That means when you say, Lord, with all of my heart, I want you. I want to dwell in your, dwell in your presence. When Jesus was in the house of Mary and Martha, you know the story how Martha was very busy in the kitchen. Unselfishly, sacrificially cooking a meal, not for herself but for Jesus and his 12 disciples. Now what could be more wonderful than that? That as soon as Jesus and his disciples come, you go into the kitchen and in the heat of that kitchen, you slog away trying to do something for the Lord. And Mary, as it were, sits lazily just wanting to be in the presence of Jesus at that time, to look at his face and to hear him. And Martha thinks that Mary is just wasting her time and not coming to help her. And she comes to Jesus and says to the Lord in Luke chapter 10, why don't you tell my sister to come and help me in the kitchen? I'm working all alone. And she thought, this is Luke 10 verse 41, she thought Jesus would rebuke Mary and say, what are you sitting here doing nothing? Go and help your sister. But this is quite different. The Lord says, my ways are not your ways. What you think is so important is not so important for me. Are you working for me? Are you sacrificing? Are you sweating it out somewhere in some kitchen or somewhere for me? And you think you're doing a great job for me and you come to me expecting me to commend you and the, I will say to you, you are worried and bothered about so many things. Verse 41. I'm not interested in what you're doing. Imagine a person who is sacrificially slogging away and serve, working hard, doing something for the Lord, and the Lord says, I'm not interested in what you're doing. There are many people who are going to face that in the final day when you stand before Jesus. 
Lord, I did miracles in your name. I did this, I did this. And the Lord says, I wasn't interested. Who asked you to do it? I didn't ask you to do it. You had your own bright ideas to go and do something for me. And with all your activity, you brought a lot of confusion into my work. But see what Mary has done. She wants to be with me. And she has chosen the good part. Verse 42, and it will not be taken away from her. Does that mean that Mary doesn't serve? You read later on in the next chapter how she brought an expensive bottle of ointment and poured it and that was a picture of service but it began with being in the presence of the Lord. So this has come home to me more and more when I've looked around and seen through many years now we have preached victory over sin. We preached about the new covenant and many of you have heard it and understood it so well that you can even preach it to others. But you're still defeated in your life, especially in your home life. And I've seen that. I've seen people frustrated, discouraged, and we can imagine, oh, we're better than some other churches because we are preaching some doctrines that are higher than theirs. But what about your life? If our life is not of a higher quality than other people's lives and we're just glorying in certain frills and here and there that we are better than others. That's not what God wants. He wants us to long for him personally. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all the heart. That's what the Lord tells people in the final day. You did so many things. I agree. You cast out demons. You did this and that. But you never knew me. You had no time for me. You know, it's like a husband or a wife or so. Uh, think of a husband, for example, who works hard the whole day earning money for the home but he has no time to spend with his wife or a wife who's working so hard in the kitchen doing so many things with her husband but she's not interested in spending time with the husband. That's how a lot of people who are in Christian work are. And those are the people whom the Lord will say, depart from me. You are not interested in spending time with me on earth. You are interested in doing this, that and the other. Depart from me. I don't know you. It's going to be a great tragedy in that day for people who thought that they had pleased the Lord by doing things for him. I want to change the focus of your vision, my dear brothers and sisters, and see that the, what the Lord is longing for was what he created Adam right at the beginning. He did not send him out to work as soon as he was created. On the very first day after he was created, the Lord said to him, this is a Sabbath day. I want you to Come and live in my presence. I want you to spend the whole day with me. And then you can go and work for me. And if you're not going to live in my presence, then I'm not interested in the work you do for me. That's the lesson that we need to learn. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our Father in heaven, I pray that the few words we have heard will form a deep impression on us that we can enter into this Sabbath rest where nothing will shake us like nothing shook you throughout your earthly life. You say you have said to us, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We want to enter into that rest, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.